morning, everybody. It's a, uh, oh, good, all right, I, I hear you. Excellent. So yeah, a little trouble with the microphone when you have a lot of hair, it's, you know, it's a challenge. Um, so my name is Donna Linewan Leje. I'm the former managing editor of USA Today, which is a media organization in the US. And uh, now I work on media strategy. Today we're gonna talk about the digital revolution. Um, it's bringing change to the world really daily, maybe every hour. And one of the things that we're gonna talk about is artificial intelligence um, and the maturing of artificial intelligence. And it's going to affect every aspect of how we do business, how we teach our children, and how we govern the world around us. So it's going to transform us in ways that we still don't even know. And how we embrace that change and how we guide it, um, it's going to be, uh, it's gonna be really important about how we do it, if we do it mindfully, if we do it inclusively, and if we do it for the benefit of future generations. What our conversationists are gonna talk about today, are they ready and mic'd up? Okay. Come on up. They will discuss today is how women can lead that change and ensure that women excel and thrive in the new paradigm. All our panelists today are remarkable women. Yeah. Uh, they have it's lists good, of achievements that would fill an Icelandic saga. But because time is short, I am going to give just brief introductions so that we can plunge right in. You can read more about these amazing women in the Women Leaders Global Forum app. All right, so here we go. All right, now I get to sit. Joining me first is Anna Birchall, Deputy Prime Minister of Romania and Vice Prime Minister of Romania's Strategic Partnerships. I have to point out that earlier this year, um, Anna spoke at the Center for European Policy Analysis Forum in Washington, D.C. And she was one of only two women out of 25 speakers. So not a good ratio there. We need to fix that. Uh, next, we have uh, Sarah Adwoa Safo, a member of Ghana's parliament since 2013. She's also Ghana's first minister for public procurement and chairs the Women's Caucus. And then we have Mari Kivinyemi, Deputy Secretary General of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. She was also, and I love this also, Finland's Prime Minister in 2010 and 2011. Good morning. All right, so let it, let's get started with Mark. What can you tell us about the status of women in the digital age? Yes, there's actually quite a lot of information already on that, and we undertook at the uh, OECD a survey for G20 uh, countries. So we tried to uh, have a look on that. How big is the digital gender gap? And there is a gap. When it comes to, for example, access to internet, on average, the gap is 11%. And this 11% means that when we take the figure uh, or the percentage of men who have access to internet in one country, and let's say it's 81%. So for women, it's on average 70%. But this is the average figure. When you uh, go to uh, different countries or continents, uh, the, the gap can be even much bigger. Like in Africa, it's 25%. Uh, percent, and in the least developed countries, uh, it's uh, more than 30%. So access is, of course, the number one uh, uh, issue when it comes to using the benefits uh, of uh, digitalization. And there are 327 million women less in the world who, don't have, who, who have access to internet than there are, are men. But also skills are a, a very important issue. And, uh, as the Prime Minister of Iceland just uh, told, that really is the key for development and also the key uh, in bridging uh, the digital uh, uh, gender uh, gap. And when it comes to skills gaps between men and women, women appear to be better endowed with literacy and ICT skills than men, 
that men are generally better endowed with the skills that command an extra wage premium in digital intensive industries uh, like higher numeracy and advanced numeracy skills, uh, as well as task-based uh, skills related to self-organization and management and communication. And also, men tend to be better rewarded for those skills. Even in the case when women have the same skills, uh, men get better salary uh, for that. So these both uh, areas should be tackled, the access and also the skills gaps in order uh, really uh, to close uh, the gender gap in digitalization. Sarah, is this something that you are seeing, um, these sorts of barriers? What kind of barriers do you see women in Ghana facing? Thank you very much. And um, I would want to start from where uh, my colleague left off. When she gave the statistics of the gap that exists in Africa, which represents about 25% if you look at the number of men or um, boys that have access and actually use and are part of the digital world compared to girls. And this is very worrying for many of us in Africa. And I believe one of the major barriers has been illiteracy. Um, we're being told that um, over 700 million people are illiterate all over the world. And out of the 700 million, most of them are women or girls. So that tells you that if we want to move and close the gap that exists, we need to focus on education, getting our people educated. And that is why in Ghana, um, we have introduced the free senior high school education policy. And I think it's receiving a lot of success stories and our people are very happy about it to the extent that last year, in 2017 alone, um, 94,000 more children were rolled on into senior high school. And this year, 120,000 more intakes for this year. And so we removed the fact that financial constraints for both parents would be a barrier for most people or most girls to go to school. So government was taking a chunk of that sponsorship and I think that would help. And we need to not just um, educate or else we are still not closing the gap. We need to strengthen education in STEM, in science, in technology, in math, and in engineering so that we can build a future for Africa where girls would see the need to be part of that technological um, exploration that is going on around the world. We shouldn't, you know, let the children or the girls feel like it's so difficult a subject and so we want to go into the humanities. No. And again, we are focusing a lot also on TVET education, technical education and vocational education, because this is where you get most of the inventions coming in. In our part of the world, Many of the children that go to technical or vocational school are looked down upon as not too smart children who couldn't make it to their mainstream universities. And that mindset change needs to be done so that it is a priority for government and it is a priority for every child. That indeed I want to be part of the inventors. I want to be someone who can um, invent Facebook-like kind of technology and not restrict it to only boys. And, 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 and by so doing, we would be able to close the gap. There should be also financial support for or um, budgetary allocation for that. If we want to commit as African leaders, we need to see the importance of the global era, which is more of a digital era. So most of our budgetary allocations, if you don't invest in something, you don't expect to reap the necessary um, positive results. So in, in, in our budgetary allocations, we should focus a lot on that. And I think by doing that, we'll move all those barriers and women and children will be part. I wouldn't, I don't know how I would have survived as a woman leader if I wasn't part of the digital world. I'm on Facebook, I'm on Twitter, I'm on, you Google and you can read everything about me. So by doing, removing all those barriers, we can be the change 
agents that we want to be as leaders in our countries. And we should also focus on building role models in that aspect. I don't see a lot of role models in the digital world in Africa. Little girls need to look up onto successful women who have studied, who are entrepreneurs in that area, and who have thrived to success. And by so doing, they can easily look up to them and say, I want to be like this woman in future. Mm -hmm. I want to quickly follow up on something you said earlier, Sarah, which was that um, uh, you, you passed this uh, program for girls that would provide you know, finance and, and for secondary education. What did it take in your country to get that passed? How did you get people on board? How did you get them to support it? Thank you very much. Um, it's, it's, it started with a campaign promise by the current administration and the current president. And when he assumed office, he thought that he needed that political will to do that because you can have all the promises before you are into government, and when you're into government, it's a new ball game altogether. But he holds education very prime and is on the priority list of government. What he did was that we started by way of a policy that came from the executive, as His Excellency the President, saying that this is what I want to do. He committed finances to that. We have, three, we have 10 regions in Ghana. Three of the regions um, have free senior high school education that was introduced by our first president when we gained independence from the British. And following that, it's taking us over 57 years for another president to come in and say, we're yielding the benefits for the three regions. Why not extend it to the other seven regions so that we can have a nationwide policy where Poverty will not be a reason to let any child stay in school. And again, we are committed to the SDGs as well, leaving no child behind. We need to carry everybody along. And if we can eradicate all the problems of Africa, we need to start with education. So it did, he did a lot, a, lot, a lot of media work, a lot of talking, a lot of engagement, stakeholder engagement, and to get the whole country to rally around that concept that if we need to move on and move on from uh, a third world country or developing country to a first class economy, we need to invest in our children who are the future. And so that's how we started it. And it's going so well. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Anna, where do you, what policies do you think government should start thinking about and start putting in place to ensure that women have equal footing in the digital economy? Thank you so much for the question. And uh, before uh, answering, please allow me, Madam President, Sivan. So this is the technology. So uh, <laughs> before we are talking about digitalization. So uh, before uh, answering to your. Uh, Great question. Please allow me to pay my respects to Madam President, to the organizers, and on behalf of the Romanian Prime Minister, who is the first uh, woman to held this position, to wish you best of luck uh, and to really uh, wish you the best uh, in your profession and in your uh, family life, and um, to assure you that um, uh, everything we are talking here we will be taking home and we will try to promote uh, during our presidency of the European Council as Romania is uh, going to uh, be the, uh, in this very important position as of 1st of January 2019. So, uh, policies. Firstly, I think empowering young women and girls through education and the mentorship and coaching in order to reach their full potential and claim their place in society is key to this approach. And education plays, as I said, a, a key role. And I think unless we are all understanding that every single penny that is allocated to education is not an expense, but it's an investment, and in fact is the best investment that we can have as a society and as a family, as parents, um, I think that's one of the big uh, bricks uh, on which you can build a great foundation. Coming to our topic about digitalization and... Um, um, artificial intelligence, cybersecurity. 
I'm telling you that uh, our government is paying a great respect to those issues. In fact, we are promoting as one of the uh, priorities during our presidency of the European Council, uh, cybersecurity, and allow me to say a few words about that, because that includes uh, digitalization. Digitalization is an area, and the internet, it's offering you a lot of uh, uh, advantages, but it's offering you uh, a lot of... Um, not disadvantages, because it's not the right word, but it's offering you um, uh, a lot of uh, danger. And I will come, uh, I'll come back to that in a second. But on the ITC, I was looking to the statistics, and um, the technology sector will create uh, half of a million new jobs by 2020. But when we speak about the involvement of, of women in information and communication technology, we can't infer, uh, uh, affirm... Uh, unfortunately, that uh, we are there with uh, uh, in, uh, you know with a high number. Uh, we are present uh, with uh, in a high numbers, and um, both at the EU level, I'm talking. So, therefore, I think one of the policies that we could pro uh, we could um, promote and implement is to eliminate the stereotypes, um, and that you know uh, boys and men are uh, going to perform better in this area. It's not, it's not true. I think girls uh, are uh, uh, at least equipped to, uh, to uh, participate and do well in that. It's just about the education again. It's about the models that we are promoting. It's about eliminating those uh, stereotypes. But if we are managing to implement that and eliminate them, then the women, the girls, young girls, who could, uh, could participate, including in the, those new jobs that are going to be created for years to come, as this is an area of a new development, uh, not just in Europe, but uh, across the world. So um, adapting to the realities and uh, trying to see the future, you know, one lesson that my grandma used to tell me all the time and said, learn from the past in order to build your present and the future. So looking at the past, let's learn the lessons and recommendations in order to build the present and the future and look at the challenges, but likewise look at the opportunities. And the ITC, the digitalization, it's an area where I do honestly believe that women could, um, could play a, a stronger role. At the EU level, it, must, uh, uh, it is a must to promote visibility of female role models in digital at school, at the workplace. And um, uh, this is what we are trying to, to, to promote during our presidency. As I said, we put there as a priority the cybersecurity. And um, cybersecurity is part of the bigger uh, task of digitalization. Uh, digitalization could be very effective in terms of uh, reducing the bureaucracy. So another policy uh, back home, you know, not just in Romania, I'm saying back home for e all of us and each of us. Uh, if you invest in uh, digitalization, that will do a lot of uh, good work in terms of uh, efficiency and transparency uh, to your governments. So coming to the uh, cybersecurity, um, I, uh, I honestly believe that it's an area where we don't pay that much attention. Um, internet, it's a wonderful thing that it's offering you a lot of opportunities. It can help you to promote uh, yourself as a politician or as a leader. But likewise, it can promote hate speech. It can promote radicalization. It can promote economic uh, damages. Uh, so much, I look at one statistic and here our friend from OECD could tell us that you lose much, you know, a lot of money every single day. Uh, through the uh, through the economic uh, um, war on the cyberspace, uh, but uh, coming to a topic that is very dear to us as mothers, firstly, it's about the danger over the internet, and that why uh, one project that is very dear to us as a government is to try to educate the kids, including in the curricula, according to their age. Uh, to try to protect themselves from uh, from uh, from the dangers of the of the cyber uh, space on the internet, and I am just sharing with you one story that will stay for me forever, and that why it made me to be so passionate about this area. Um, a few years back, when I was chairing the European Affairs Committee in the Romanian Parliament, uh, I was. Um, involve a lot with um, directives, opinions that we're supposed to, to give and we gave to, the, to Brussels, to the European Commission. And uh, I was part in one of the very informal talks with a mom, a French lady, 
uh, Moroccan origins, uh, settled in France for two generations, that lost her son in Syria because he was radicalized uh, through the internet. And obviously, as a mother of a boy, imagine how I felt. But leaving that aside, while I think one strong policy for all of us is to look at the cybersecurity. Um, another policy uh, that I could, um, I could run through is um, trying to give that confidence to girls that they can perform very well in uh, any uh, subject. I think that if we, we will manage through education, policy, models, coaching, mentorship, if we will give that uh, trust in themselves, that doesn't matter the circumstances, doesn't matter the area, they will always do well. Um, I think that, that will be something that we should uh, work for and uh, in the end, if we achieve it, be very proud of. So, I'm closing because I'm sure there will be a lot of other questions, but um, um, it will be very important for us, for Romania, to take uh, the recommendations that you uh, could provide to us in order to promote on, uh, uh, during our presidency, because digitalization, it's an area where uh, all of us will be very interested because it, it's part of an uh, uh, important future, uh, adventurous future, but those adventurous future, this adventurous future, we can create it so well if we put the bricks, uh, the right bricks, and that means security as well. So thank you. So one of the things that has uh, struck me in what two of you have said so far are the stereotypes. Um, you mentioned, Anna, that, um, that uh, girls are not considered for certain uh, types of skills. And Mari, you mentioned that some of the skills in STEM uh, that are possessed by men more than women are, are valued more and men are paid more for those skills. So how, Mari, do you think we can drill down on that and, and erase some of that gap? So that really is one of the key questions we should be tackled because the case is that still, when we look at young girls uh, at the age of 15, only 0.5 of them uh, dream of having a profession in ICT sector, but 5% of boys are dreaming of having a career, of uh, being a professional in that sector. There is a big gap already at that age. And it really is so, and that is what we found out also in our survey, that uh, uh, women face those stereotypes and social cultural uh, biases. But our advice is really uh, to get rid of them and encourage girls and boys uh, to uh, choose whichever career they want. And that is also in the hands of for us as parents, but also in the hands of, uh, of teachers. And there are biases there. So every one of us, us have to look into the mirror every morning and think of that, that are we really encouraging as well boys and girls to really use all the opportunities they have uh, in the life in the, in the same way. And, and we, we really have to work every day rather hard, of course, depending on country. In some countries, there is more uh, work to be done uh, in order to get uh, rid of those uh, stereotypes. But as was mentioned already many times here, education and skills, that, that really uh, is their key. But it will take a rather long time before we reach um, parity when it comes to uh, uh, those who graduate in ICT sector, because now it's only 25% of women, 25% uh, of those who graduate from ICT sector uh, are, uh, are women, so still a lot uh, needs to be done. And also we have to encourage uh, uh, women uh, to be active uh, in startups, and we have to improve the financing possibilities, because women have much more difficult uh, to access uh, finance when they are, are starting a business. And, and during the, uh, also the, 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 the term of, of the business, it, it really is the case still that despite the fact that many countries have developed uh, uh, very good vehicles uh, uh, to support women entrepreneurship, uh, 
so more needs to be done that we have uh, really be that we are able to uh, to uh, support also a women's business at the same t uh, way as we are doing uh, with uh, with men and also uh, we need role models as was mentioned uh, here uh, or already more role models uh, for uh, girls uh, and and women and adult education so that you have the possibility uh, also to educate yourself properly uh, at the later stage of, of your life. But if I could just add, because this is an area, the digitalization, the ITC, it's actually an area that should be promoted uh, from the angle that uh, it will help to balance the family life with a career, because it gives you a lot of flexibility. You can work as long as you are uh, you know, uh, with a laptop, you can very easily work from anywhere. And that's, uh, that's an angle, at least in some societies, that it could work very well because it's giving you that freedom to organize your schedule according to the needs, especially at a very young age when, you know, you, 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 your schedule is made by, uh, by your kids. Um, so uh, let's try to look at from from this point of view as well. And I'm not so sure that those advantages of the area of women being involved in this uh, domain is so heavily promoted. And I fully agree. I mean, it's um, it, it comes down to the very early age through the educators, through the teachers, to really guide and give that trust that uh, girls could uh, could choose this area, uh, uh, you know, on equal footing. I guess. Mm -hmm. Of course, I there are two sides I'm to that coin. Um, we, of course, don't want to see women marginalized, right? And, and that's not a marginalization. That if you balance, if you are giving the freedom, the flex security that we are talking about, if you are giving a, a woman, a mother, the freedom to have a career and likewise to balance the, the life, I think this is an area where it's giving you that flexibility and that that freedom more than in other areas. At least this is how I see it. So. Mm -hmm. I, I think that um, when it comes to the early childhood education, we need to place a lot of emphasis on that. Because um, the Bible says charity begins at home. So it, we shouldn't only look at the classroom education, but the home education as well as parents. In Africa, you come to our countries and it's a dream of every parent to see the daughter be a, a lawyer, be uh, an engineer. You know, there, there is um, into bracket some, you know, top jobs that they want their kids to grow up to become. So many a times, even if the child has that early creativity, they kill it and they want to refocus them to be who they want to be. And I think that that needs to change. If we, the statistics are saying that we are the largest continent to have this disparity when it comes to the digital or ICT um, training, then we need to look at that as well. And then if we reckon that women are to be part of the economic development of our country, then we would focus on closing gaps at every level, including digital. Why do I say that? In Ghana, 52% or 53% um, of our population are made up of women, and that is half of the population, or even more than half. So if we reckon that they are economic players, they would contribute to our GDP growth, and that we need to let them be part of it. Many jobs all, the, all over the world has a digital touch. You have to go on the internet, you have to do something that has to do with ICT. So if we keep the girls out and we don't train them, we don't let them be part of that journey to a digitized world, then we're keeping them out of the economic um, sector as well. Mm -hmm. And they'll be losing money. They won't be able to take care of their homes. They won't have that financial autonomy. In, in, my, in my ministry, for instance, we've, we, we're, we're going to launch a policy very soon that seeks to give at least 30% of government procurement or government contracts to certain marginalized groups, which are women, the youth, and persons with disability. I will focus on women and girls for now. We're going e-procurement with the support of the World Bank. We're, we're going e-procurement. How do you go e-procurement and have a policy like that? when women are not part of the digital world to take advantage of such procurement. So 
it boils down to the fact that if we want to move the country forward economically, culturally, and the, in a digital way, we need to carry the girls along, we need to have the women along, because they are major players. And leaders should reckon that we are major players and determinants of the future of our countries. Thank you. All right, we, we have just a few minutes left to go, so we're going to do lightning rounds. So, yes. Mara, you just, want just to say commenting, something? I, I think that it's, of course, an important uh, uh, item that uh, uh, digitalization gives you also the freedom to work from home, but we should not create a, a trap for women to stay at home because women's participation in uh, labor force is really the key so that this gender gap in digitalization can be uh, then preached. Uh, and that's why we have to always mention the good services for daycare, for education for children, afternoon care, and also uh, the, uh, we have to share the joy and burden of parenthood together with men. It's not a, uh, it's not a, look, I don't want to be misunderstood here. It's not a trap. It's about uh, another option. It's a choice for them to pick up if uh, you want. For, to me, it doesn't matter where you work from, as well as you are balancing uh, and you have that uh, joy of seeing the life through the, uh, you know, the life through the eyes of your child doesn't matter where are you, and as well as you are happy that you are having a career, I think that's a, that's a good balance. So it's not about being a trapped or a marginalization, it's about giving options for women who would like to pick up those options to be there. And, and I think this is... Uh, and of men. course we can so give exactly. men an so option this, too. This is, this is an area where uh, you have much more freedom than in other, uh, in other areas. But coming back to the, uh, to the main topic, I do believe that everything comes to education, and the education in all senses, education that it's at home, education that's in the society, and education that uh, is, uh, is at the policy level that we all uh, need to promote, and education comes along with the models. So uh, um, it's, uh, you know, the, the digitalization, uh, generally speaking, is uh, it's, uh, giving you that uh, freedom, but it's giving you some responsibilities and obligations, and those goes together. Okay. All right. Well, we have run out of time, but clearly there is so much more to say. And I'm going to use the moderator's uh, prerogative and say that one point that we did not address, but that we absolutely should, is the venture capital. I heard Steve Case uh, speak a couple of weeks ago, and he noted that women get less than 10% of the venture capital for digital ideas. And of course, women don't have only 10% of the ideas. So uh, clearly very underrepresented there. I'd like to thank all of our panelists and the government of Iceland and uh, the Women Leaders Global Forum for uh, allowing us to do this panel. And thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.